very, very honored that as we, uh, that we have as our last panel member uh, the Honorable uh, Joseph uh, Iaguardi, former two-term congressman from the state of New York. Uh, Joe uh, is a graduate of Fordham University. Uh, for 22 years, he was an active member of the public accounting uh, profession, serving uh, for 12 of those years as a partner with Arthur Anderson, particularly at a time frame when Arthur Anderson was exerting a tremendous amount of leadership in helping promote the idea of improved government accountability. Uh, in 1985, he resigned from the firm to run for Congress and fortunately won. Um, Although I don't know whether they would have given your job back or not, Joe, but we, we hope they would have. But he did serve for two years, and during those two years, uh, he was the only practicing CPA in the entire Congress, which meant, which meant he brought in a very special perspective uh, to, that, uh, to that role in that office. He was the original author of the CFOs Act that was signed into law in 1990 by President uh, Herbert Walker Bush that has impacted all of our lives, particularly those in the federal government. Since leaving Congress in 1989, uh, he's not only pursued his, his uh, professional obligations and, and businesses, but he has headed up a number of nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, I should say, uh, organizations, including Truth in Government, and through which he continues to speak for fiscal reform. Uh, he has been a keynote speaker a number of times in groups such as the Association of Government Accountants, the Institute of Management Accountants, the Association of uh, American Association of Accountants, the academic group, and I think very importantly, put pencil to paper in uh, 1992 to author uh, a book entitled Uncount Unaccountable Congress, It Doesn't Add Up. Most recently, I had the pleasure of being part of an all-day uh, panel uh, of those testifying uh, to the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board on issues such as uh, booking or not to book Social Security, and also on the proposed sustainability reporting that uh, that uh, standard setter body, standard setting body, was was uh, considering. It's again an honor for me to introduce former Congressman Joe Diaguardi to come up, and he's going to take what you've heard so far today, I think he's going to share his perspective, he's going to share uh, how he sees this perhaps being part of the public dialogue, and I wouldn't be surprised if he tried to get us all to march out of the room waving a flag by the end of his talk. So Joe, Thank you, thank up. you, thank you. I come from New York, and New York and California are right now in very bad shape. In fact, the budget deficit is projected over the next three years to be almost $50 billion in New York. Uh, already, New York is ranked as the 49th state out of 50 in terms of its uh, bond rating, the lowest bond rating, because we had a governor, and you know, I'm not going to get political and tell you which party he was in, but we had a part of that was uh, a governor that was bragging about being conservative and reducing taxes, but he never reduced spending. So obviously, he had to borrow the money. It's kind of what we're doing in the federal government. And that's put New York now in a very tenuous situation financially, fiscally. Uh, you may have read that now the state Senate is in disarray. Uh, we don't know who controls it even today because two uh, Democrats defected to the Republicans and one went back. This is a travesty on the people of New York to have this lack of accountability and this lack of sense for what the people want, not what the politicians want. But it also goes on in Washington. I, uh, the stuff that you sent me Ed, was so compelling. Uh, it, it, you, you could have a seminar just on the four-pager briefing uh, that you took the time to send me so I could get a much better perspective. I know you've worked a, a long time in putting together the three volumes, and I hope we can find a way to really publicize that. But just to summarize some of the key points that Ed made, which are some of the points that I made in front of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, which, by the way, is a board that was created 
by the Chief Financial Officer Act that I authored and was passed the year after I left Congress, signed by President Bush. The problem is that board is not independent. That board is funded by the Congress, it's funded by the OMB, it's funded by the CBO, and you, we need to take numbers away from politicians at all levels of government, federal, state, and local. We're not doing this. And as a result, you can't trust the numbers. That's why I wrote this book, Unaccountable Congress, in 1992. I didn't have any staff who could write this. Most of the staff in Congress have history majors, English majors, political science majors. You, you might find one or just a few that have maybe a master's in business administration. But certainly there were no accountants. I'm still the only practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the U.S. Congress, House or Senate. That may shock you. I mean, you know, it is a legislature, so most of them are attorneys, because they come out of the state assemblies. And that's a natural progression for them. But this is a crisis, that we don't have people who could understand the budget process the way I did. And thank God, in Arthur Anderson, as Ed, Ed mentioned, that Anderson took the lead when it was assigned by the Secretary of Treasury to unbundle the financial problems of New York City. We literally had to piece together a financial statement for New York City in 1975 as a price, uh, or, or else the bailout wouldn't have happened. And I was, one of the young, I was one of the young partners at that time assigned to that group and learned a lot. In fact, after that job was over, the head of the firm at that point decided that we would, as a firm, take on the same concept or the same challenge for the federal government. And it was Arthur Anderson that created the first prototype U.S. consolidated financial statements of the United States of America. And they did it for five years for nothing and then passed it on to the Secretary of Treasury in 1981, I believe it was. Uh, and guess what happened as soon as we passed it on? They took Social Security off the balance sheet as a liability. If you go back to the booklets that Arthur Anderson wrote, um, Truth in Financial Management in the Public Sector, uh, Truth in account Accounting in the Public Sector, and we had an appendix with the first financial statement explaining it, and it was very clear that the firm concluded and these were, you know, kind of giants in the accounting profession, concluded that you have to record Social Security as a liability, even though legally the case is made today by the FASAB that it's not a legal liability because the Social Security law says that if we run out of money, it goes down to 78% of the benefits, and if we keep running out of money and go bankrupt, it goes down to zero. So that, legally speaking, there's no obligation on the part of the federal government to pay Social Security. And yet everybody who runs for office says it's a lockbox. We know that's a lot of nonsense. And, um, you know, they, they've got, it's a trust fund. We know that's a lot of nonsense. And, you know, it's hard to believe that the FASAB could conclude that it's not a liability because it's not a legal liability. But when that booklet was prepared, and I hope you go back into the archives somewhere. I'm going to put this on my website. And you can see the case was made very clearly by Arthur Edison that even though it is not a legal liability, it was a promise. People voted for people based on that promise. And it should be recorded. But this is the kind of nonsense we're facing today. So obviously the FASAB is a conflicted agency. When you have representatives from the Treasury on the board and they pay for 25% of your budget, and they have board members representing that 25%, they make a very compelling case uh, as to why it shouldn't be recorded. Now, my view right now, and I've got a pretty good view, don't forget, 22 years of Arthur Anderson, assigned to the public sector aspect, among other things in Anderson. I leave, no one gave me a chance to get elected. I challenged a Democrat, I was a Republican, in a very liberal Democratic district. No Republican had ever been elected. And I would even mention my party, People asked, I never put it on anything. I realized that I was so outnumbered, I said, I'm the common sense CPA that's going to Congress to unbundle the problems for you. 
And that's what I saw as my mission. And I won by just a few hundred votes out of 300,000. And I was lucky to, to, to last for two terms. I was kind of redistricted out by a Republican governor afterwards. This is the problem. You could be a good congressman, but politics doesn't reward you for being a good congressman. It depends on a lot of other factors. And that's maybe why we don't have too many CPAs running for Congress, because you have to give up a lot to do it. Uh, I found it a joy. My parents were immigrants. I've always felt the challenge of doing something important with my life. And I left the firm after 22 years feeling that I would never go back if I lost. I would do something else with my life. Uh, but God willing, it, it didn't work out. But what did I see when I was there? And by the way, I was on the government operations committee and I was on the banking committee. So I had two good committees to view uh, through. And that was a good prism. Prism. Uh, <laughs> M. <laughs> so uh, what did I see? I saw then what I see really today, that government has totally abandoned fiscal responsibility, public accountability. It doesn't exist in Washington. And I'll go through and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, we had that meeting with the FASAB, and I was happy to find out recently that they have issued a statement on fiscal sustainability. So they're going to now supplement the book that you saw with a statement on fiscal sustainability. Uh, I agreed with that wholeheartedly, but it doesn't give enough information. I'm not going to go through it. You can see it on my website, my, my testimony. And before you leave today, by the way, Take a copy of this. Yes, I am the author of the CFO Act. This is one of the articles published by the then National Accounting Association. Now it's called the Institute for Management Accounting, right? So I decided to put that on the cover. But that little pamphlet is kind of an update on this book, Unaccountable Congress. And you can have both. This you can take today. And I, had, I couldn't bring enough of these down. It's too heavy to carry a lot of copies. So I left my card there. Anyone who writes me, will get a free copy of this book. Truth in Government gives it out freely, mainly to college campuses. I believe in empowering the young people of America that it's their money uh, that we're playing with. This is intergenerational inequity. That's one way of referring to it. Now, I was inspired to put the credit card on the cover because, as you can see, I'm holding a plastic card. Many people don't know that Congress votes with a plastic card the same size as your credit card. You put it in at the end of a row of seats. And I realized, and we had deficits in those days, too, under Ronald Reagan. Now we have huge deficits. But I realized that every time I put that in, I was raising the national debt. So chapter one of this book is the most expensive credit card in the world is a congressman, a congresswoman's voting card. And here it is on the cover. Credit line unlimited, expiration date never, built to future generations. Please take this book. Um, you hear David Walker speaking. Uh, about a lot of the things that are in this book. He's told me he's read it, and it was written in 1992. Chapter 5 is entitled, Congressional Child Abuse, Congressional Child Abuse, Send the Kids the Bill about Social Security. Chapter 4 is The Big Apple and Washington, One Bailout After Another, where I forecast the potential bankruptcy of the United States of America. In those days, I was considered a radical for saying that. Now, people are starting to whisper these things, as you heard from Ed, about the ratings of the Treasury bills. And who knows how long China is going to keep lending us some money. We're a hostage already to Arab oil. Now we're going to be a hostage to Chinese money, countries that don't share our values. Is this the direction that we want to take for the next generation? Relax. I'll tell you what you can do about it in a few minutes. <laughs> so, uh, the federal government absolutely, as Ed said, cannot sustain the current path that it's on. Not only do we have on the books, uh, not only do we have $11 trillion of bonded debt, of which approximately $4.5 trillion is Social Security money and some other trust fund money that we took out, that we collected in excess of what we needed in prior years and that's the payroll tax, as you know, the FICA tax. That money was not left there. That money was quickly taken and spent on other parts of the budget. And I'll tell you who authorized that in a minute. Both parties share a lot of blame here on this. So it's obvious that the states have an immense 
interest, vested interest, in what's going on in Washington, especially the analysis you just saw from Nevada and, and Massachusetts. That's only two states. I would like to see the stress test done on New York and California. That would be uh, probably mind-blowing to see the dependency of, on New York, of New York on the federal government. And that's one of the things I'm going to go start talking about on my TV show. Who is going to volunteer to start doing this? Certainly the politicians are not going to volunteer it because they don't want to give any more bad news. In fact, that's the problem with politics today. They'd rather defer the bad news to the next administration, the next election, whatever it is. What's the short-term fix I can get away with today? I was there. Believe me, I'm not speaking out of school on this. So the problem is that there hasn't been a sustained and loud voice on what I'm telling you about. I tried and I'm trying still. I'm a volunteer. I've never been paid as a lobbyist, although I, I do a lot of lobbying on, on human rights with my wife, Shirley. In fact, there's a good example because Shirley and I, over 20 years, created a new state called Kosovo. There hasn't been one in 18 years. It was just recognized by the United States. We were the first. How did that happen? It happened because I brought that issue to Congress in 1975, 85. And when I left and met Shirley, my first wife passed away. Shirley is an international expert, and she was a book publisher. We decided to do what I call strategic lobbying. Certainly, we collected money from Albanian Americans to put into those people, uh, to give to those people who supported our efforts. I'm only saying this because I know what the model is to win. You're not supposed to change foreign policy. Uh, there was no question in our minds that the policy that we had in the State Department was a failure. Just look at Bosnia. Look at the concentration camps we covered up. Look at the people who left the State Department and resigned because they were covering up the facts. They just didn't want to get involved in it. Well, Shirley and I made sure that that information was brought forth we had hearings with Senator Biden, Senator Pell, Congressman Hyde, Congressman Gilman, all the key people, and we made sure that our PAC gave them the maximum amount, because there are limits on what you can give. Why was that important? We didn't want them to know how poor we were. So we always gave the max, because they figured if they give the max, they must have access to a lot more money, we better listen to them. Why am I telling you that? Because information is a distant third to the votes, and that's the number of people you bring to Washington or have around you, and the money, the support that you give your congressman and your senator. Then information. You're into information. You empower everybody. You empower me sitting here. I've learned things. We try to bring this to Washington because we want to empower Congress. And they have their staff sitting most of the times. Most times they don't have the time to sit in themselves. So we do empower them. But that is the third leg, and it's a distant third to money, and to votes. You have to understand that. So now when you understand that, then you've got to play to that system. That's what we did for the poor Albanian people that were subject to genocide under that guy, Mosevich, and got them a new state called Kosovo, even though there was another state called Albania next door. Very complicated. So I don't think this is as big a challenge as you think. You need to become involved. I wish I had 2,000 people in front of me right now, because we need that army. There is no question. Without an army of people with a sustained and loud voice, people like yourselves that are professionals, it's not going to change. But don't look at yourself as a professional. <coughs> look at yourself also as a citizen. You have a moral obligation to speak up because you are knowledgeable in areas that most people are not. So what's the obstacle to all of this? It's obvious that politics trumps accountability. We see it in the way the FASAB was formed. We see it in the way the budget process has changed. And let me just quickly tell you what's wrong with the budget cap process, the accounting process, and the reporting process. Aren't those the three things that we worried about as CPAs and accountants? The budget process is completely broken. It doesn't exist. It's a word that has no meaning in Washington. Just read my book, because I had to go back and research the evolution of the budget process. But let me tell you where the big problem started with that great president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He decided, when he saw these surpluses building up in the Social Security trust accounts, that he wanted to disguise the cost of the Vietnam War. Now, was he thinking like an accountant? 
No, he was thinking like a politician. So he decided to come up with a new concept called the unified budget. In other words, I could take the surpluses out of any trust account, so-called trust accounts, and net them against the deficits in these other domestic accounts before I report to the people what the net deficit is. So, even Clinton, who said he had surpluses, that's a lot of hogwash. There was never surpluses. If you used the right accounting system, forget about the right accounting system, just get rid of the unified budget, there were no surpluses. We had to use the Social Security money to reduce the deficits in order to create those phony surpluses on the Clinton. Where were the accountants? Why don't we speak up on these things? That's the unified budget. It's still not changed. And if it were changed, you'd see the deficits dramatically bigger. It's common sense. You can figure that out. So we got a problem. What was the next thing we tried to do with the budget process? Graham Rudman, when I came in, let's reduce the deficit over four years, 25% a year. Well, after one year, they figured they couldn't do it, so they made it five years. Then they had to do seven, then they gave up on it. In 1990, they came up with the Budget Enforcement Act, pay go, pay as you go. You cannot spend anything unless you raise taxes or you reduce expenses somewhere else. You know where that went, gone. Now they're coming up with a new pay go, Obama, which is really arrogant when you think about all the deficits we're creating in the next 10 years. Can you imagine his estimate is that we're adding $10 trillion to the $11 trillion that's already bonded on the books? That's $21 trillion. Even if the interest rate stayed at 4%. And we know they can't because there's so much money out there, inflation has to come back. On the card, what was it? 20%. The prime rate was 21%. So, you know, we got to start thinking about what the interest on the national debt will be in 10 years. It's going to be a trillion dollars at 4 or 5%. So we don't have to wait for anything else to be fiscally unsustainable. Let me get into the accounting. The accounting in the federal government is a fraud by SEC standards, an absolute fraud. And I want to hear more accountants speak that way. We cannot accept a system that is so different from what the SEC imposes to protect shareholders. Who's protecting taxpayers? We're taking our kids' money and spending it now. Is this fair? Isn't fairness probably the best word we have in the accounting profession? I remember Leonard Spacek in the 50s and 60s. He gave like 200 speeches and every partner in the firm got that book, Fairness, he entitled it. And he even said, we need to take numbers away from the corporations, the gaming the system, and the government. We need an accounting court. Why don't we have, like the Federal Reserve System, an independent branch of government just for numbers? We need it. It's logical. Why aren't you talking about that? You know, it, it, it makes me sick to think that we've come this far without imposing real gap and real accountability on the federal government. Let's go to the last one, the reporting process. You saw the book, 100 pages. I got to Washington a day early on Sunday with my wife Shirley so I could read that book. And I read that book. So I'm one of the few, I guess, that read it as well. But can you imagine giving that book to a taxpayer or to a citizen? They wouldn't understand it. And that's why in my book, the first chapter is that you need a one-pager. And I put in a bill. All the bills that I put in, and they're accounting-oriented, are in the back here. One of them was to give the taxpayers a one-page summary of where their money went and include it with the tax return forms. 100 million people file 1040s. When you send out their forms, give them a page. You know why it didn't pass? Because the CBO scored it. It would cost too much money to put that one page in. 100 million returns. That's why it didn't pass. And by the way, in chapter one, I say, don't give them a P&L. Most people don't. You can have my book, sir, if you want to take it. Okay? Uh, most people... <laughs> I hope he's not a congressman. <laughs> in any case, uh, it's, I said, people don't understand. Most people don't understand profit and loss statements because they have their investments through their pension funds. So I designed a creative way to report to them. I put the budget of the United States of America into a credit card statement. I said, here's your share. I divided 100 million taxpayers into the national debt, and that was the numbers that they report. You could do it another way with the off-book items. And I said, here's your share of the national debt per family or per taxpayer at the beginning of the year. Here's what we bought for you, purchases. 
your share of defense, your share of social security. And then I said, here's what you paid, your share of income taxes, your share of payroll taxes, and it begins to resonate. And then I said, interest, this is your share of the finance charge, other than that, the finance charge. At the end, your new balance due at the end of the year. You know what? A lot of people like that. So maybe we have to be more creative in the way we give information to the average public. Sure, that statement's important for sophisticated users like us. And in between, we have to have others. And he came up with some great ideas in the paper he sent me. For instance, we should brief the governors, have a separate briefing. With, when the financial statement comes out, get them together with their staffs and the congressional um, delegation of that state and have a briefing so that they understand the significance of what is in there. Well, as you can see, I can go on and on speaking, and there's a lot to speak about, but I guess my time is up right now. And I would just tell you that you need to look at all this and say to yourself, how do I get this message out to others? The one thing I'd like you to do today is not only take that pamphlet, but take at least one more to give it to your boss with my card and tell them if they want a copy of this book, all they have to do is write me. Uh, we give it out for nothing. That's part of what I do with truth in government. You might say, well, how do I make a living? Well, thank God I'm a CPA because I'm on the boards of a few companies, so I don't have to spend a lot of time to make a good living, and my wife and I devote more than 50% of our time to human rights and on the issue of accountability, and I think that's very American. And the last thing I'll tell you is that if you want to see my daughter, Kara, she's the fourth judge on American Idol. You probably don't know that. And uh, Tuesday morning, she's substituting for Kelly on Regis and Kelly as a co-host, so you can see her there. But in any case, I'm so happy that I have this opportunity to talk to you. And uh, Ed, thank you for all the good work that you're doing. And the work that you're doing in Nevada is great. You've got to get that into New York and into uh, California, two big states. Here's my daughter telling me how proud she is. She's not investing in the market. She's got, she had to move to the West Coast in LA. She's investing all of her money, and she's making good money. She's written 200 songs, besides all the stuff you see. She's a dad. I'm investing it in California municipals. I don't pay federal tax. I don't pay California tax. And I'm saying to myself, maybe those bonds are not going to be worth anything. <laughs> I got to give her some other, other advice. Okay, well, thank you so like much. like paying taxes. One quick question. <laughs> yep. Is this there hope, especially for those of us who are going to be retired? Is what going to be there? Is, is there hope? Oh, is there hope? Hey, you know, hope does spring eternal, and we have to be optimistic. This country has faced big challenges before. The problem is we can't trust the way things are going on in Washington today. We need to somehow get involved now, because what will happen is, and the hope is, you know, you know when things change? When there's such a crisis that there's no other choice. So we know at some point it's going to change. But we should not wait for that. We should be talking now about the real problems. Okay? How about a round of applause for our presenters?